many of you know that on the heels of every great victory, there always comes some something or other that usually plunges us from the highs we experienced back into the depths of, uh, back here again. How many of you know that? Good, okay. As I, again, I ask these questions sometimes rather almost scared that only one hand will go up like, oh, I'm an alien. <laughs> but this is one of the reasons why I, I love God's word. You know, I can find encouragement in a lot of things, but there is nothing that encourages my soul when it seems either the odds are against me, the deck seems stacked, nobody likes me. <laughs> <laughs> but I always come back to the same place, which is this book that gives me encouragement. I... Thank you. I want us to look at someone who is, all these people, if you've had a Bible for any time, all these people become somewhat familiar to you. But I want to I take a look at Elijah for a specific reason today. So I ask you to turn to 1 Kings 19, because um, that's where we're going to camp. And let me just say some background. There are things that I, I don't, I think we, we read by so many things and we never stop and put the brakes on of some of the oddities that God seems to use here. You remember, Elijah appears out of nowhere, chapter 17, and Elijah the Tishbite, chapter begins with and, and comes out of nowhere. And it's almost staggering that someone could step onto the stage of what I'm going to call history, be an incredible, we'll call him a firecracker. And yet, some of the perplexing things, like he tells, God tells Elijah to go to a brook where he's going to be able to drink from that brook and he'll be fed by ravens. Now, I know you're so familiar with this story, but I just want you to stop for one second and think about this. God used what is labeled in Leviticus 11 as an unclean bird, unclean, to feed his servant. I mean, I want you to get the visual here of things that I find truly, like, they're mind-jarring. Imagine Elijah, whatever he looked like, sitting at that brook, the banks of that river Chibar, wherever he was there by the brook, but I want you to picture and envision, here come these ravens. Now, you know, the ravens didn't stop by the gourmet restaurant and pick up, like the stork, and pick up a specially wrapped, fancy box, swan neck to go item for Prophet Elijah over there. Ravens like carry on, and that is not the baggage that you take on the airplane. Roadkill. So we have an unclean bird feeding with unclean food. I'm just, that's mind drawing. And then I have the vision of him sitting there and these birds coming to him. I want you to picture this imagery of the birds coming and feeding him. Now, I hope he didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> but did they... Did he do this? And they went, Dook. a little bread, a little meat, Is that like a little mix something sandwich. I don't know. <laughs> but if you don't, you know, if, you, if you're not careful, you can read by a lot of what is said here and not put the human side on. I'd be scared crazy if I saw these big giant blackbirds flying towards me with food in their mouth because, I don't know, would they mistake that my head or my eyeballs or my ears are food too while they're dropping off food? They're like, okay, a little bit for you and a little bit for me. 
So God uses unclean, and we'll, we'll juxtapose that with down the road where he sends an angel, which I believe is a Christophany, and says, arise and eat. From the unclean to the absolutely spotless. And so go until the brook dries up. I've done many festivals, and we've got a lot of messages on this passage I'm referring to. Then go to a widow's house after the brook dries up. Go to a widow's house to feed you there. I want you to take note that every time God gives some instruction, as wacky as the, it's pretty wacky. Think about it. I mean, if God, if I was the prophet and God said, go to a set place, I'd probably say, you know what, I'm good, I'm going to fast for 40 days. Thanks. Nope, thank you. But birds are going to feed you. Now you're going to, when the brook dries up, you're going to go to a widow's house, and she's going to feed you there, and he gets there. Please make this a reality check on what God's word sometimes says and what it appears like in your life. Because God said, go there, she'll feed you. She's coming out there and gathering up sticks, and she says, I'm going to go bake a little cake for me and my son, then we're going to go die because we won't have any food. And he says, oh, first of all, get me some water and then bring me some... Bring me some food first, and then feed you and your kid. And the promised provision in there that there would be enough, by the way, caveat to that, until the rain came, which is like three years later. So they had food in their house for three years, food supply for three, miraculous food supply, by the way. But you know, if God told you one day, hey, you go to and pick the most unlikely place, now, I'm not offending anybody here. I'm just saying, go to Compton. <laughs> or, I don't know, pick another place. That was a bad choice. But, um, yeah, we're going to pick Compton. And I want you to find the most um, gourmet restaurant. And, you know, right away there, there's kind of some challenges going on. But, you know, okay, I, I, I go, I, I go, and I'm looking around, and I, I don't see anything. And, of course... The most gourmet restaurant in Compton may be something that you'd never look at twice and say, oh, that's a gourmet restaurant. But in Compton, that's a gourmet restaurant. God does things like that sometimes, and this is the, the illustration of it perfectly put, that to the seeing eye look absurd, look impossible, look ridiculous. God, I have to do this? I'm going to look stupid. I, I said that about me. <laughs> You're going to have to do what? Uh, okay. So I'm looking at the prophet's life, and I'm thinking, he never once said, God, instead of ravens, could you, could you change the birds to doves? That'd be much more pleasant on the eyes. Or instead of doves, could it be squirrels? But he never said a word. And when God said, go to the widow's house, or go to the, find the widow, and she'll feed you there. I mean, he, he could have said, well, can I go to the brethren's house down the street? That'd be much more comfortable. Never said a word, never complained, which sets the stage for what I'm about to say that is the mind-boggling part of this man's story, which is great victories, great provisions. I, I wish I was teaching a message today on on God who provides, because if you look at all the things that God provided for the prophet, which we would never think of as provisionary in the sense of our needs when we are destitute, when we don't have, but then God always provides exactly what we need. I made a list here. He supplied, supplied the, the brook, the birds, obviously, to feed him. Um, he had provision in the years of famine. Uh, the Lord provided fire from heaven, provided eventually the rain to come, provided him to outrun Ahab's chariot. There's another impossibility. I don't understand how he girded, it says he girded up his loins and he ran and he surpassed Ahab in his chariot. That's, that's like six million dollar man on steroids there. <laughs> so there's a lot of this is kind of mind boggling because you can read through it and you can almost turn Elijah into a caricature and not See, this is a man, we're told in the New Testament, of like passions, just like we are. And the clarity on why he's just like us. And, the, and there's so many, as I said, so many messages in here. 
I was hard pressed to try and figure out, well, which one do I pick? But as I've said, chronicling all the things, he marches into Ahab's uh, court, the palace, makes a declaration regarding the rain, marches out. We read, if I'm fast forwarding because I'm short on time, we read of that great victory on Mount Karma with the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah and how, you know, the contest, my God is better than your God. And of course, I love it. I love the fact that these things, which are so preposterous, are included there for us to say, yeah, this actually happened. Gods of uh, the prophets of Baal, all getting their offerings ready and consumed, and here's Elijah, and he's getting his ready. And of course, it's kind of funny because Elijah's saying to the prophets of Baal, yeah, you need to shout a little bit louder because they were marching around and parading and making noise, calling on their God to, to consume their offering. And he was kind of like egging them on. He said, why don't, you, why don't you yell a little louder? That'll help. That'll get you God's attention. Do it a little louder. And they did, and they started cutting themselves, and nothing happened. And then Elijah, you know, he just to make sure that nobody suspects that there's some funny business here, he gets buckets of water. And I know I love Dr. Scott's little old lady. Where'd they get the water from, right? <laughs> Takes the bucket of, buckets of water, and there are multiple buckets, and he douses the whole thing so that the water is overflowing and then calls down fire from heaven. The whole thing's consumed. I mean, even that, I wish we could not make it into a caricature, but put flesh and blood and see all of these people standing around, probably with the eyes the size of saucers, looking at what just happened. Fire was called down from heaven. This, this offering that was once there is ashes. There's nothing left. And they're still looking at what their God was supposed to do, which obviously he didn't. But great, great, great victory. And I sometimes think that we tend to look at this man and see the great victories. But you see right after this, he flees. Well, he's told, by the way, and messengers come from Jezebel, saying, essentially, you're toast. But she does it in such a way that I think sometimes, sometimes people miss the point of why she did what she did. It was tastier to her to abase him, to devaluate him, to tear him down in front of the people that he was with by making the, sending this messenger. You know, gosh, I used to know somebody who used to say, I wish God would, would do these great miraculous things like he did in the Old Testament, you know, where people are being consumed. And, and yeah, I agree with that sometimes. I've had thoughts <laughs> once in a while, every now and then, I, I have those thoughts. But, but there's an admonition here and a really great lesson that Elijah will have to learn, and God's going to teach him the lesson. Sign seekers, beware. Now, unfortunately, there still are a lot of people who get enamored with large crowds, and I'm not knocking anybody's healing ministry, because I do believe there are a few who have the gift of healing. There are very few, and they're not the big circus fanfare preachers. There's a few I believe God has given the gift to. But people still come, and you'd be surprised. People will still come looking for the massive display rather than the small things that God uses. Now, I could chronicle the small things, the small things that God did, which are really not small at all, but using the birds to feed the prophet of God sending him to a destitute woman to feed the prophet. These are low things. These are base things, which is right out of 1 Corinthians, where it says God uses the base things to confound the wise. Well, there's a whole lot of confounding going on here, because that's seemingly what God did. And at the same time, sign seekers, as, as I said, beware. There are several things that I gleaned out of this passage that struck me to the core, really. The prophet's expectations. You know, he expected that after the display on Mount Carmel, after the great display of calling down fire and all the things that had been done that had been reported 
that the whole nation would be converted and go back to worshiping the one true living God versus, versus the idol worship. He believed that the display of God's power would win over the populace and they would become believers. So when we encounter him fleeing for his life and running off first under a juniper tree, a broom tree, to lament and ask God to basically kill him, it's as if, put flesh and blood on this, it's as if he was expecting after God did this great display that the whole nation should have repented and started following the living God again. And when that didn't happen that way, and it didn't happen visually for him, he couldn't see it. He wanted to remove himself from where he should have been. He wanted to remove himself from the path he should have continued on to go and lament under that tree, it's better for me to die, I don't want to live anymore. Now, some people get this confused, and they just think, well, you know, he, he, was just, he was depressed. He was just down. But there's a whole lot more to this. And this is what really caught my eye. His expectations were wrong. Set your focus aright with God. That's the first thing I kind of got out of this. Set your focus aright, because he lost his temporarily. That tells me that any man or woman of God who is committed to God's way and to God's word sometimes can lose focus, and the prophet did lose focus. He, he became so fixated on what God should have done that his great wind inside that he was so high and mighty about became deflated just under a tree. And by the way, we have some idea of the juniper tree that's given here. It's really more like a stringy bush. It's not like the juniper trees we think of. Uh, I don't know what you're, you're thinking is. I had, to, I had to look for this one, and it's just got very poor shade, by the way. If you were looking for refuge, it's not a good place to take refuge. It's not a big, not a big shade tree or bush. He's under that thing. After the great victory, God displayed under there, and he wants basically to die. And that's where I pick up in the 19th chapter. He's, he just encounters Jezebel. So I've given you the background at least, and then some perhaps. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now, obviously, what just happened with the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as one of them, as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And as I said, this was a deliberate, uh, deliberate intent to discredit the man of God. And just so you know, there's nothing new that happens. Satan uses the same devices all the time. He'll always send a Jezebel. When you read in the New Testament about the mention of Jezebel, or people say the spirit of Jezebel, they have, an, I think, a wrong idea of that spirit. That spirit is not only anti-God. Don't talk about she, she painted her face. It's anti-God, and it's with the intent to cut down, kind of like a, an Esau, a profane person, but with the intent to discredit, with the intent to tear down what is of God. And it's pretty clear right here. She did this not only to threaten him but, and to let him know, you, you too, but we'll discredit you at the same time. When he saw that, there's a few things here that I, I circled in my Bible. When he saw that, he arose and he went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, this is what's interesting. I circled a few of these because it's, it shows me how could a man who made such bold steps of faith to go, and be, to go by a brook and drink out of the brook and to be fed by ravens and to go to a widow's house and to be fed with nothing, miracle provision, and we could keep going right until Mount Carmel. How could, how could that same mind... When he saw that, I circled, he saw, he arose, he went for his life, he left a servant there. 
everything that was the norm in this man's life, he saw. He's now, by the way, he's now a sight walker. All up to this time, he was actually completely walking by faith. God said, go to the brook. He went to the brook. God said, go to the widow. He went to the widow. It's the first time, and this was an illumination for me. He saw that. You know, he, he just faced eight, nine hundred prophets on a mountaintop. You'd think he'd be, he would have been scared there, but one woman with a, a wicked spirit saying, you're going to die too. All because God, by the way, didn't, didn't make this miracle tent event, didn't get everybody converted. Elijah, when he's at this point, he's lost his focus. So he saw, he saw that, he arose, he went for his life, which reminds me horribly of the prophet Jonah. You know, you got a call to go to Nineveh? Oh, man, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Tarshish. And it's free. No, actually, he did have to pay the fare. But it just reminds me of that. But he himself went a day's journey, went into the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It's enough now. Now, Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, this is what is, I mean, I was reading this, and I was thinking, well, this is pretty disturbing. Great expectations of God, and it just doesn't happen the way I knew God was going to work it out. I want to go and die now. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, and I want you to notice, I don't know if it's random that he ended up under the juniper tree, if he picked that place, I don't know. But I want you to notice where he takes his rest and where he takes his refuge, under a juniper tree, which, as I said, it's not the big, tall tree. It's just kind of not very much shade-type tree or bush. As he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him. You know, he said unto him, Rise and eat. Now, this is the comedy of reading this. Somebody, if I was asleep under a tree and somebody started poking me, I'd say, whoa! <laughs> I'd move. Yeah, it's very calm. And he looked. <laughs> and behold, it's just like nothing. Like, sure, I see angels every day. <laughs> he looked and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals. I can never pass by this either with thinking, what, no, what type of cake, don't say angel food, what type of cake was it? <laughs> cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And I want you to see the grace of God, because God sent the angel, which is very interesting, as I said, angel of the Lord in the next verse, but God sent an angel to touch him. We go from the extreme dirtiness of birds feeding him to the height of holiness. I believe a Christophany because the next passage says angel of the Lord, which is either a theophany or Christophany, God appearing in the angelic form as a messenger. But I want you to see the grace of God that God knew he needed to have his body replenished by food and by rest. Now, this is strange because normally I always say, oh, who needs rest? You know, yeah. But God prescribed this this way. He could have said, now, before you, I feed you and before you get any sleep, I'm going to send you off to thus and so. But he let him eat twice and sleep twice, whether it was a nap or whatever, I don't know. And I thought, you know, that's, that's something that I think is often missed, that sometimes the prescription that we need is something simple and within our means, a good meal and some rest. Dr. Scott used to say, use rest as a weapon. Okay, somebody else said that, but he used to say that all the time, all the time, except to the staff. <laughs> and <laughs> 
just in case the lightning bolt came down on me. But it says here, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. It's interesting. God lets him sleep, feeds him, he arose, he did eat and drink, went, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights under Horeb, the mount of God. Now this is what's disturbing to me. If you know the geography of where he is, maybe a day south of Beersheba to Mount Horeb, that is possibly maybe an eight-day journey, not forty days. So I don't know, was he wandering around in the wilderness going, I don't know, I should go this way, no, I should go this way. <laughs> I, I, I don't have a GPS, so I'm just going randomly. Okay, follow that mountain, get to that tree. Oh, wrong turn, I have to go back. I don't know, 40 days, an eight-day trip took 40 days. But you know that 40 in the Bible means a complete time of testing. And I don't think it's an accident. Just like the children of Israel, with that famous number 40 or Jesus going into the wilderness, same thing. That number represents a complete time of testing. So 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. And this is what is so fascinating. For 40 days and 40 nights, which should only have been seven or eight days at the most, sunrise and sunset, no food, walking wherever he's going, and had plenty of time to think about what should have been or what was going to happen. Why he was going to Horeb, by the way, is a big question mark. God didn't say, get up and go. But if you read back again, it says, for him to eat and drink, or eat, arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. So I'm going to say that God would know or have knowledge of where Elijah was going to end up. And I don't believe that it's all wind up, but that's a pretty remarkable thing. And it says, he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. The next thing I'm going to say about Elijah is it seems like his human substitution for making God his refuge and comfort becomes clear. We went from the juniper tree to the cave. Well, the cave seems infinitely better, doesn't it? Has more protection. But he still wasn't trusting and making God his refuge. So we have him under a juniper tree, we have him in a cave, a strange place for a man of God to end up. No, not really. Just sounds strange, because David was in a cave too, and I think a lot of other people ended up in caves. What they did in the cave stays in the cave. <laughs> I don't know, I just want to make sure you're not bored. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? I want you to see with me, please. The question that God is asking is not like, Hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? It's not like that. It's a soul-searching rebuke. And I want you to notice something. Listen to the prophet's response. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. If I was God, I would have said, Hello, you listening? I, I asked you specifically, what are you doing here, Elijah? Do you ever meet people like that? You ask them a question and they answer with something completely off the mark and they, they have to have this long-winded response to something that should have just been a yes or a no. That's... Wait. Just crazy, because he's going to do it again, by the way. He said, go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord. Now, this is amazing to me. The Lord passed by, and yes, I do believe that was probably in the same place where Moses stood in Exodus when God showed him his glory, kind of like that, in the cleft of the rock. I think that's the same place, and I think God makes no mistakes. 
because I also believe that in the book of Revelation where it speaks of the two, I believe that these two are linked by diverse Moses and Elijah, by diverse uh, connections in the Bible. That's a message for another day. But I, I do believe it's possible that this is the exact place. The Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Now, just halt right there and imagine, because you can read right by this in one sentence and you, you, you don't paint the picture. He says, step, you know, imagine him standing right at the border, at the threshold of the cave. He's just, he's not quite in, he's not quite, he's right there. And this wind, you know, you've seen the reporters when windstorms come and they can, I don't know if they're, they just pick the worst place to stand, but they're being blown around. And imagine the prophet standing there with this tremendous gust of wind, but it's not just wind that's just winding by, it's wind that is actually, the description's pretty good. I can only imagine, it says, that it rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. That's pretty strong wind. Just try and imagine stones being, rocks and stones being spewed everywhere in the sky. That's, it's very violent. You know, King James, you tend to read it in one sentence. It's, oh, yeah, you know, the wind came and there was rocks. And, yeah, it was very violent. And imagine him standing there and watching this. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake now, we've all, we all living here in Southern California, we all know what that's like. We all have some experience in an earthquake. But I want you to, again, I want you to envision that right where the prophet is standing, it wasn't bad enough to have the gusts of wind and rocks being hurled all over the place, but now the, the earth is shaking. Imagine, I mean, in my mind, I would think fear would have gripped him. We have no response, by the way. It says, after the earthquake, a fire. By the way, the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. The Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Now, I, this is my moment of illumination here. It is the problem with a lot of Christianity. People are looking for God in the big stuff. I've said this and I've lamented about this many times. It's the sign seekers. It's the people that say signs and wonders. And that's how, by the way, the people in the last days will be completely misled. Signs and wonders, great signs and, signs and wonders being performed by the Antichrist. Well, that must be God. <laughs> no one can do that. But if you really look at it, this is what's interesting. You comb through the Bible and you'll see that those real visible things that God does where it's visibly clear, usually check out who's the recipient of those things that are clearly visible, like Pharaoh and Egypt, where plagues, unmistakable plagues have fallen on Egypt. And what does it say about Pharaoh? It only hardened his heart. It didn't convert him. This is the mistake a lot of people make. They say, well, if I could just see a great, fabulous sign from the Lord, then I'd know and then I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. And the proof for that positive is Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh, told the people he was with, I'm going to die, and in three days I'll be raised up again, and I'm coming back to get you. Feeding the 5,000, raising the dead, healing every type of disease. They all saw it. Did it make them converts? I don't read that there were 10,000 converts. That the ones that were there listening to the Sermon on the Mount, they were all there at the cross. Do you read that in some book somewhere in the Bible? No. Usually those great things that are so great, they do not convert the soul. In fact, usually they bring more curiosity and more disbelief because it's so incredulous a thing. How could this be? But God uses the still, small voice. And Elijah, by the way, when he heard it, he knew. Now, I'll tell you the greatest sermons in the Bible, some of the greatest sermons in the Bible, weren't preached by human tongue. God used 
something small and seemingly insignificant to preach a sermon that brought one man to such great repentance that it's recorded for us in such a profound way? Peter, Jesus said, when the cock crows thrice, three times. At that third time when Peter heard, that was as good as any eloquent preacher preaching the grandest sermon ever delivered, because Peter heard that still small sound, not a voice, but a sound, and knew, and it pierced his soul. God does that. And somebody might say, well, but, but God doesn't speak to us today like that. That's correct. He speaks to us through his word, by his spirit. And I'm, I always marvel at this. When people get into this debate about, well, you know, the Lord talks to me and he tells me these things, and I hear people say this all the time. Well, here's logic. We say that Christianity, Christ, is formed in your heart by faith, that God has placed his spirit, his Holy Spirit, in you. So there will be a measure of God speaking to you within you. It's like the omniscient God peace placed in you. There, there should be something that is in your belly. I'm not talking about the feelings that you feel, but concerning the word or concerning things that bring conviction. There should be certain things, but they may not be audible because we know as in the beginning was the word and the word logos, that's Christ's name written in Greek when we read. In the beginning was the word John is referring to, the word Logos, Christ, which became for us this written word, which is also now the preached word. And this is how I keep going in circles to come back to some place to say, of course, it seems logical on the one side to say, yes, his word still speaks to us today. When people keep saying, the Lord spoke to me and the Lord told me a thing, well, listen, good for you. I've always said the Lord hasn't spoken to me audibly, but there are things I can, I can instinctively and intuitively know. Hey, I'm the message. I'm, I ought to not be preaching this because God keeps pointing me back to this other passage over here, and I, I've told you this before. That's listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But what's interesting here is he recognized that small voice. Sometimes in Scripture, God uses those small things to bring to pass a great purpose. Remember Jonah? God sent a worm and a gourd to accomplish his purpose with Jonah. I think about this. The worm, just a small worm, God used that. What I'm trying to say is that most of the time when God uses these small whether it's a voice or whether it's a creature, base things, small things, usually that's where you'll find God. And the prophet knew immediately when he heard, it says, when he heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out, stood in the entering of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, here it is again, what doest thou here, Elijah? Now, it's the second time. What are you doing here? I wish I could say it and make it sound the way I think it should sound. <laughs> I want you to take note of something. This is why I, I really don't have patience for people saying God does this or God does that, because every time that God speaks to somebody in the Bible, he speaks to them personally. He speaks to them directly. He usually speaks to them regarding their action or their attitude, but they are the subject. When people say, well, the Lord told me to tell you, and they go on about something that doesn't concern them, there's no pattern of that in the Bible at all. So when God speaks, for example, and it's never random, like, you know, hey, you, what are you doing over there? There's Jesus coming through town. How many people do you think were up in the trees? Because I don't think Zacchaeus was the only guy that climbed up in a tree. I just think it's recorded that he went up in a tree. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, short man, come down from the tree. This day I must abide in thy house. I, 
I, Jesus is speaking King James English. Uh, but rather he said, Zacchaeus, he called him by name, gave him a direct command. He knew his name, spoke to him. We have the same thing happening with Mary. She comes to the tomb, supposing that he was a gardener. He's now been raised from the dead. She says, tell, tell me where they put my master. And the words are uttered, Rabboni. And she, he says to her, Mary. He, he talks to her by name. You know the scripture that says, he knows my name. He knows your name. When he is going to audibly talk to you, I believe if that ever happens, he'll, he knows your name. He's going to speak to you that way, but he speaks to our hearts today through his word, through the preached word, through reading, through the spirit. So, and by the way, there's a great pattern. I could go on when Jesus is, John 21, talking to Peter, and he says, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He speaks his name to him. It was a word directly to him, and this is the way God does it. It wasn't random here, you know, hey, prophet over there. What are you doing here? Doing. God said that. He said, doing. He left off the G. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, if we go back to the same thing again. You'd think after the first time he would have, he, he would have catched on that he still doesn't understand what, why God is asking the question. Listen, he's going to say the same thing Exactly the same thing again. And he said, I've been very jealous for God, for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altar, slain the prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, he was right about that, that they seek their, his life to take it away. But it's like God's talking to him. Hey, how are you? Oh, you want to know what? But the day I had it, just. Oh, did you ask me a question? It's kind of like that. When I read that, it's kind of like that. Like God said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, but, 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 and that's the way we are. We, we never get it, usually. And that's why I love the fact that God repeats for the hard headed ones that are present. He repeats a concept. I, I asked you. You know, if I was God, I would say, boy, I asked you a question. <laughs> and now, because you can't get it, I'm going to rain down something terrible on you. I don't know. That's what I would have done. But just see, the agency that God used, a still small voice, and the effects of that, he immediately heard and knew You'll know. Well, there are people that go, again, I'm going to repeat, hunting for signs. You'll know. When a message is being preached and you feel right on the edge, it may not be through the whole thing, but right on the edge somewhere, you've made a connection. That's God's word calling to you. I might ask you today, what are you doing here? Not because you're in the wrong place like Elijah was, some people come in to the church to mock, to make fun. Some people come into the church for curiosity. Some people come into the church because they think that's entertainment. And in some places it is. Some people come into the church hoping that they'll have an experience. They will have a display of power. Do you know how many times I've seen this? I hate to tell you, but a couple of years ago, I had the misfortune to go to a lot of different churches. And I say misfortune because that's, that's where these things would happen so often. People getting worked up, emotionally worked up. You know, here comes the preacher and we're going to rile you and everybody's hooping and hollering and everybody's going crazy. And, oh, I really feel the Spirit of God here right now. Really? Because <laughs> I have better meditational connections when I go in my prayer closet. And if I want to hoop and holler by myself, God doesn't care. But you see what I'm saying? It, 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 it's this that just leaped out at me, that sometimes we're looking. 
especially those people coming into the church, they're looking for some big sign. They're looking for the, the absolute proof, yes, this is God's work. Oh, yes, we're, you know, we're, we've had many healings here today. We had, a, we had three people raised from the dead today. <laughs> Actually, two, one was just asleep. <laughs> and one man who can walk without his cane. <laughs> That's because somebody stole it. <laughs> Listen, I believe that God heals. I believe that God does incredible things, but I'll, let's bring this to the here and now. I know that everybody crowded into chapels and churches and temples. Let's take 9-11, because it seems like the biggest blur in, in our history. And when I say blur, I mean a lot of things simultaneously, a lot of tragedy there. Everybody crowded in and you had people having you know, masses and people got really religious for a little while. But did it keep those people in the pews? Did it keep those people with their eyes fixed on God? Now, only God can know that, but I can tell you that this is the nature of the way we are. We, we hit a bump. We're there for a little time. And then it's just kind of like grass. We just fade away. So usually, it's in the still, small voice. And I, I just, I love the fact that God wasn't done with him. See, he thought his life was over. There's a few things that I, I can say about him. There were two assumptions that he made that were false. He thought his life and his ministry were over. Now, I've heard a lot of people in my brief time in the pastorate and then a little bit before say, oh, my ministry's over. No, your ministry is over when God says it's over. Your service is done when God says you're dismissed. Otherwise, you belong to him. I know that sounds terrible. Oh, my goodness. How could she say that? But we make certain declarations out of the scripture. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Well, then that means that I'm his. And I'm his to worship him, to please him, to service Two assumptions. His ministry is over. His life is over. The other one was that he's the only one. And this is where I said I would make the bridge to you. God had 7,000 somewhere peppered in that country that hadn't bowed their knee to Baal yet. Now, you can say whatever you want, and I, I you know, we put Elijah on this big platform but these two assumptions, my ministry's over, I'm done, and I'm the only one. That's why I've said, I've even checked myself sometimes and said, no, there are other ministries doing, they just don't have as large a forum, they don't have as much exposure. There are 7,000, God says, that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. And no, Elijah, I'm not done with you. I am going to reinstate and recommission you to go out and do three things. You are to anoint three people. You've got work to do. You may think just because the success didn't happen. You know how many ministers I meet that say, well, you know, we, had a, we wanted to have a revival, but we only had 20 people come out, and that didn't go too well. Well, why can't you have a revival with 20 people? What's wrong with those 20 people? They smell or something? What about these 20 people? Well, we were expecting really large crowds, but what is 20 people praying then for your community or for their loved ones? I mean, 20 people can do a whole lot together. Well, that's just not, you know, we expected some great thing to turn out for us. Isn't that the spirit of Elijah? You know, I was expecting in this great demonstration from Mount Carmel where everybody was, you know, they were just blown away by you, God. Your performance, it was just incredible. You just, you smoked everything. And I thought for sure when they saw that, they would be on their knees saying the sinner's prayer. <laughs> mm. God's response is very unique. Because the Lord said to him, verse 15, go. This is what I love about God. He didn't even bother after he gave his shtick a second time about, I'm the only one, and they're going to kill me. Da, da, da. God didn't even bother saying, whoa. It's like God was saying, hey, listen, you've got work to do. Go, 
return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, you'll anoint him too. Three people to anoint. I'm not done with you. I'm not finished with you. This is probably the, the, the biggest part of this, is a lot of times we think we've, we've done the most pivotal thing, and now God's done with us, and we're just going to, you know, we're going to spend these years mellow here and camping out in happy land, because God doesn't have a greater commission for us. Still deciding, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm in charge here, God. You know, I, my ministry's over. I, I, I'm done. I'm the only one. God says, nope, nope, and nope. So, of course, in, in, in Elisha, he's, you know, he's handpicking his successor for him. It shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And here is the, the icing on the cake. He says, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. You know, God is not, I believe, has not changed. He's not going to uh, start trying to perform great miracles to impress people, because this is the chronicle of great displays of great power that didn't, all it did most of the time, displays of great power just hardened people's hearts. Now, maybe Elijah thought, in all of this, Ahab would be converted, and then Ahab would convert Jezebel, and then everybody would be happy. But it doesn't work that way in God's plan. So the thing I took out of this, and I wanted to just kind of gestalt it down so it makes there's some crystallized things. Don't look for God in the, in the neon signs of life. Don't look for God. I think you can, you can go just about anywhere. This has happened to me many times. I've even asked you this. Where you're out in nature, and you just happen to look up, and you notice the trees, and you see creation. That suddenly conjures, it brings to my mind psalms that speak of his creation, and I'm reminded of that. And nothing has, there's not been one sound except maybe a gentle, just a gentle zephyr, just a little breeze the wind, the leaves, a bird, that triggered my mind to remember this is his creation. Sometimes the agency that God uses is, not, is, is complete silence. Through his spirit, complete silence. But I just want you to get fixated on this one thing, because if our expectations are right, that God gave his word and his word will not return void, if our expectations are not fixed on something outside of what God desires, which is his will is put out plainly for us right here, and if we are keeping our focus straight, you know, that happens to all of us. I've said we, there many times we have these prodigal moments. They're not, some, some people it's longer than other, but, you know, you can just kind of lose sight for a little while, or the syndrome that I've coined where people start looking inside and if you read in your own devotional Psalms 42 and 43, it's, the psalmist is like he's looking down here. He's not looking up at the light of God's face anymore, but he's looking down here, and everything that's here is centered on me. Poor me, suffering me, pity me, help me. I'm the me, right? So focus. And then the last one that I would say, which is don't try to solve your own problem. If you're seeking the refuge, which is not under the broom tree or in the cave, or the juniper tree or the cave, but seeking it in him. The psalmist says that God is our refuge in a time of trouble. He's our helper. So the message today is pretty simple. For those people who are coming into the church who are fairly new, don't, a lesson out of Elijah, don't look for the big, powerful things. God may use those, but through and through his word, it's pretty clear that he does not. He uses the smaller things, the quieter things, the gentler things. Now somebody said, well, what about the Apostle Paul? Well, he used a voice there on Damascus Road. 
I'm not sure that the events of, of Saul listening, Paul listening, were gentle, but I think the voice may have been, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Still a voice speaking and calling out by name to his chosen vessel. Now, if you're in the Elijah syndrome today where you've, you're looking back at some of the great victories and now you just feel like God's left you in a lump, I want you to look at something very clear in the overall thing. God had to heal the prophet's heart and had to heal his mind, gave him the rest, and then he gave him another chance because he wasn't finished with him. And really the message is for us, God's not finished with us. We don't decide. We've had enough. We don't decide. The battle's over. We don't decide. It's God saying, I've called you. I've chosen you. Now I have a commission for you. For you, for you listening to me today, your commission is the life of faith. Not to do like at the moment the Jezebel reaction is, I saw, and the minute I heard that, I saw and I fled and I took off and I was scared because God is not the author of fear, but rather your commission is to the life of faith, which isn't always easy, doesn't always put you in the place. This ought to be proof positive that not every day is a Friday. <laughs> but rather in those experiences, learning to trust God and learning, as F.B. Meyer said, to trust the giver of the gifts instead of the gifts. So I put this all together. If there are Elijahs here or the spirit of Elijah here, I'd ask you simply, what are you doing here? Not as in you shouldn't be here, but what are you doing here? Are you receiving? Are you here to feed on God's word? Are you here to grow spiritually? Are you here to be part of the body which is going to grow and become glorious because God said he would build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, if you've heard what I've heard, if you've heard what I've said, and if you're reading the same scripture as I am, the end result is God says, I got a commission for you. God has a commission for you too. I hope you'll rise to that challenge. It's a pretty simple one. Walk by faith. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.